Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, so excited to be here, Toronto. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, so just to follow up on what Lynn said, yeah, I didn't, so my PhD at Cornell is in computer science, not in agriculture. Growing, growing up in India, I did spend summers and winter vacations with my grandparents. They used to live in a village in northern Bihar, in a place in India. And I did not like agriculture back then. There was no water, no, no electricity, no bathrooms, and so I hated that time. But in a way, it's time to give back. I've seen agriculture in the worst form, using the most primitive methods. And the work I'm doing is kind of like a startup within Microsoft, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Basically, what we are doing at Microsoft is through this AI for Earth program, using AI to solve some of the hardest problems in the world, agriculture, water, biodiversity, and climate change. Today, I'll talk about agriculture. So the world has a food problem. The world's food production needs to increase by 70% by 2050, compared to 2010 levels, to feed the growing population of the world. The key question is, how do we get there? The amount of arable land is limited, the water levels are receding, the soil's not getting any richer. So that's a problem that agricultural scientists have been thinking about this problem for quite a while. And the most promising approach to achieve that challenge seems to be that of data-driven agriculture. What we mean by data-driven agriculture is the ability to map every farm in the world and overlay it with lots and lots of data. For example, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil? What's the soil nutrient level? What's the soil pH level? If you could create maps like this, it would enable techniques like precision agriculture. What we mean by precision agriculture is the ability to do site-specific applications of input. For example, if you had maps like this, you could apply water only where it is needed, where it is needed in the farm. If you had maps like this, you could apply pesticide only where it's needed. Precision agriculture as a technique has been shown to improve yield, like, for example, in the more fertile parts of the farm, you could plant seeds closer together. It's been shown to reduce cost. You would use less water, less pesticide. It's also better for the environment. You're using less water, you're using less pesticide. The other technique, once we started talking about the ability to create these maps, we were approached by a lot of big companies, seed companies, that they believe such maps can help phenotype plants better. Now, phenotyping is another thing I can talk to people outside of this talk. But in this talk, I'll primarily focus on precision agriculture. So precision agriculture as a technique was proposed back in the 80s. It's been 30 years since then, and the technology still hasn't taken off. And the key reason this technology hasn't taken off, even in the developed world, is the cost of existing data-driven agriculture solutions. Just to give you an idea, I was at an expo, and there were several companies presenting the latest and greatest precision, precision ag equipment. And the cheapest sensor package that was available there were five sensors for $8,000 and a recurring cost. To think of farmers, why would, they, why would they buy this kind of equipment when they don't even know what is the ROI of buying this sensor package? That is the goal of the Farm Beats project. The goal of the Farm Beats project is to bring down the cost of these data-driven agriculture solutions by two orders of magnitude. We want to bring it down from 8,000 to 80. And I'll talk about some techniques based on which we think we can get there. So the first reason existing solutions are so expensive is because of connectivity, that is, the farmer's house has some sort of connectivity to the cloud, but the actual farm could be a few miles away, right? And by the time, sometimes connectivity exists when you plant the seeds, by the time the crops grow, the connectivity is lost. So how do you provide connectivity, not only to sensors, but cameras, drones, all that stuff from the middle of the farm? To solve this problem, we use, uh, so I joined Microsoft Research in 2005 and I had started working on a project called the TV White Spaces. The MIT award was for that project. So the TV White, that's the technology that we use here. What the TV White Spaces enables, I know many of you might not know about it, is imagine if you buy a Wi-Fi router and you put it in your house. Imagine a scenario where you could access your Wi-Fi connection a few miles away. Now, that would be super cool, right? Right now, as soon as you exit your house, your Wi-Fi connectivity is gone. The way we achieved that, the few mile of connectivity, is the technology we built was a way to take a Wi-Fi signal and put it in empty TV channels. So these are, you know, when you watch over the air TV, these are TV with antennas. When you browse over the air TV on some channels, you receive a certain transmission. On the other channels, all you see is white noise. There's no transmission coming there. With this technology, we were able to put a Wi-Fi signal in those empty TV channels in a way that did not interfere with, an in with a reception in an adjacent channel. So you could be watching Channel 7 at home. On Channel 8, we could be sending Wi-Fi signals. 
Now, the reason this is so cool is that compared to Wi-Fi at the same power level in 2.4 gigahertz, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther. And this is purely based on physics in free space. Once you put it through trees, crops, canopies, your signals just keep going through. So back in the day, in 2009, we first showed this technology to work. In 2010, we hosted the FCC chairman. Uh, he saw this demo. And this was made legal in the US in 2010. Since then, it's been made legal in several countries, including Canada. So over here, you can start using this technology to connect uh, to really get this long-range connectivity. Just to demonstrate by example, what you're seeing there is the TV channels available in Seattle, and the gaps are the white spaces. So in the context of agriculture, the key insight was that TV towers are where people are. In Toronto, you would have TV towers. The farms are away from the cities. Because they are away from the cities, they have fewer people, you have fewer TV channels. If you turn a TV on in the middle of a farm, you'll find fewer TV channels. Well, that's not that great news for farmers. For us, for connectivity, that's great news. The more empty TV channels there are, the more unused spectrum there is, the more unused capacity there is. We are talking of hundreds of megabits per second of unused capacity out in the middle of the farm. At which point, we are not only talking of connecting sensors. You, be, you could be connecting drones, cameras, tractors, getting a lot of data from the farm that you previously just couldn't gather. This morning, I was at a farm in Minnesota. That's where I was coming from. And there, the farmer, they were deploying equipment. And the biggest problem is connectivity. With this solution, we believe, we, just like Wi-Fi connects your house, this spectrum, the TV white spaces technology, can be used to connect your entire farm. So with this, with the TV white spaces, we're able to bring down the cost of each sensor. But the second challenge we faced was, I said we wanted to build maps like the one you're seeing there. In order to build, say, a moisture map, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil? If you wanted to get an accurate map, you need a sensor every 10 meters. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage. It'll come in the way of the farmer as the farmer is doing the day-to-day -day job. So the key question is the last bullet here. How do you build such a map using very few sensors in the field? For this, we use AI and we use drones. These UAVs, they, they come for like $1,000. You can buy them from the internet. They cover large areas and they are automated. And they have a camera at the bottom so you can get an image of the entire farm. The key technology we built was a way to take this aerial imagery of the farm and use that to interpolate data from a few sensors to build this map for the entire farm. So what we do then is if you have a farm, we'll put a few sensors, we'll fly the drone to get the aerial image. And the key insight that we embed in that is that if two parts of the farm look similar, not only in RGB, but in multispectral or hyperspectral imagery, they are likely to have similar values. And we encoded that in a machine learning model, and we use that to interpolate. I'll present some of the results later. The thing is, if you wanted to use this technology in places like India or Africa, we are working with the Gates Foundation. As I said, that's my ultimate goal, to take this technology that we are building, to take it to the smallholder farmers in India, Africa, and other parts of the world. Drones are still expensive. We run into lots of issues using drones in this part of the world. One, they still cost $1,000. Two, they have limited battery life, and power is an issue in these parts of the world. And the third is they run in, we run into regu regulatory concerns. That is, in some parts of the world, if you have to fly a drone, you need to get permission from the Ministry of Defense, at which point it's not going to happen. So then we needed <laughs> another solution. So the way we do that is we use a low-tech solution. These are helium balloons. What we built is a mount. This thing is tethered to the ground, goes up 150 to 200 feet. This is like a four-foot balloon. The mount you're seeing there. You, a farmer can put their smartphone with the camera facing down in a battery pack, and that thing can stay up from four to seven days taking imagery of the farm. If you think of it, so the, there's a farmer, a smallholder farmer in Carnation, who's using this to monitor floods in his farm. Every time there's a flood, he has to throw away all his crop because of regulations. With this, he can actually monitor to see how the flood came, which crops were touched, and only throws away those crops. In places like India and so on, someone could just walk around with a balloon, and then we use computer vision algorithms to create these kind of maps for the entire farm. The key challenge is a drone is more stable, a balloon moves around with the wind. So then how do you leverage that to, build, to still build these auto mosaics? So the way the system works then is we use fly the drone or the balloon, get the image, build these auto mosaics, use a few sensor data to train the machine learning model, and then use that machine learning model to build these precision maps for the entire farm. So the key takeaway is you'll hear a lot of startups doing drones, a lot of startups doing sensors. We believe we are the first who's been able to combine both of these in a meaningful way. 
The third challenge is I told you how you could get a lot of data, do machine learning, but you can send only to the farmer's house. The connectivity from the farmer's house to the cloud is weak. That is, most farmers pay for broadband, but all they get is one to three megabits per second, and it's also unreliable. So, like there's a farmer in upstate New York, every time there is a snowstorm, the con internet connectivity in his farm is gone. So how do you solve this problem? Our key insight is that most farmers have PCs. If they don't have a PC, we ship them a box running Azure IoT Edge on a Windows 10 device. It's sitting in the farmer's house. Everything inside that big blue box is running in the farmer's house. It takes data from sensors, from drones. It does the computer vision to do the panorama generation. It does the machine learning to build the heat maps, which then drives those ag services to the right. The ones in blue are the ones we built. The other ones are the ones we are working on. We also take data from cameras and do deep learning on the camera data. I'll show you what we are doing there. In addition to that, we also have unique storage. This thing can run offline for up to seven days. The interesting thing is you'll hear of a lot of people talk about ag gateways. These four bullets on your bottom left are the ones we think are unique here. One of the key things here is that, and this is where I want to appeal to the startups sitting in the community or people looking to do startups, is this gateway device sits on the edge. It's sitting on a farmer's house or office. All these blue boxes are running as Docker containers. So I was giving such a talk at another conference organized by the National Corn Growers Association in the US. There was a startup called Slant Range. They came to us and they said, hell, we build an, an awesome sensor and some analysis on top of that using machine learning. It's sitting in the cloud. We were able to Dockerize it and put it to the edge and start offering that as a solution when we talk to partners. We did the same thing with DJI a couple of weeks ago. You might have heard the announcement uh, at Microsoft that FarmBeats and DJI are partnering together to bring these solutions. DJI, by the way, is the world's number one drone manufacturer. And we are bringing these solutions to farmers worldwide. So I would appeal to you, if you're thinking of solutions around this, do reach out. We'd love to have host your solution on our FarmBeats edge as well. So these are several deployments going on worldwide. We don't have anything in Canada yet. Would love to get something started here. Uh, some of the insights that we provide using FarmBeats, how are the farmers using it? This is a farm in upstate New York, which is a 2,000 acre farm. This is a four kilometer stretch. The farmer wanted to know how his cows are doing once they're out in pasture. So he flew the drone in the farm, transmitted the data over the TV white spaces to the edge where on a PC we did machine learning and started providing insights to the farmer like from left to right, the grass is growing back well, there is a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season, the cows are pooping well, well this is important information for the farmer and this is deep learning trained on cow poop. <laughs> this is where the cows are, this is a stray cow that needs to be herded in, all of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone. The state of the art, if, you're using, if you use drones, is you'd usually take the SD card out, go to the city, upload all this to the cloud. Because in a 15-minute drone flight, you're generating over a gigabyte of data. You would send all that to the cloud, wait for a day before you get feedback. With this, it's near real time in farming, 30 minutes. This is for the farm incarnation. This is a five-acre plot. We show the farmer these beautiful images. We overlay this with data. This is a soil moisture map. We can flag that the top left part of the farm is moist, even though we did not have a sensor there using the sensor fusion technique I talked about, combining sensors with drone imagery. This is a pH map. After the farmer had applied lime, we can flag the parts of the farm that are still acidic, the dark parts of the farm. The question you'd ask is how accurate is this? So we went in over three five acre plots, we went and collected 1,000 measurements, and then we asked the question, if we just pick 10 of these, how accurately can we predict the remaining 990 points? And this is how accurate we were in terms for temperature, pH, and moisture. And this is how accurate the actual sensors were. That is, the temperature sensor was reporting temperature in one degree Fahrenheit. What we are claiming here is not that we are more or less accurate than existing systems, but that uh, more uh, than existing sensors, but that we are so close to the actual values that these results are actionable by the farmers. In the research paper, we've actually compared this to state of the art. There's a method called Craigings, which only uses ground sensor data. With that, we are three times more accurate on the same data set. This is a deep learning scenario where we have cameras in three barns streaming data to the edge again, where we are identifying cows, where the cows are healthy, how many cows are there, and flagging all this information to the farmer. So that's what FarmBeats is. FarmBeats is a new way to gather a lot of data from the farm using Azure IoT Edge, using the TV white spaces, and then translating this data using all the advances in AI into something actionable by the farmer. So uh, these are some of the farmers we've been working with, really awesome partners. And feel free to add me on, uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. My, my ID is Ranveer Chandra. Would love to chat more if anyone has any ideas on how to take this further. Thank you.
Okay. So we've got a time for a couple of questions. I mean, I know that you probably have 10,000 questions because um, that was just making my mind like swirl around with so many different thoughts about what, what the future could hold. Yeah. Any questions in the room? We've got some people with roaming mics. Couple of questions. Anyone's, everyone's in stunned silence. <laughs> yeah, totally. We got one. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I really, really enjoyed your talk. You're super cool. I was wondering if you had the opportunity to go back to when you were 15, is there any advice that you would give yourself? Um, I think uh, this is what I tell to people in the research community and also to startups. I think at some point, in addition to making the startup profitable, making a lot of money, if you could also think back about how do you give back to the world or getting anything that has influenced you or touched you, keep that at the back of your mind, either directly through your work or through your volunteering work or through, especially in the technology space. All of us are in the technology space. We learn so much. If there is a way we can give back. Agriculture was one of these things that at Microsoft we got the opportunity to to go give back. But that, again, we are trying to take it, stretch it all the way to smallholder farmers in India, right? So as 15, yeah, at, the, at, at 15, you should just, uh, I think people should just equip themselves with more knowledge. I think learning never stops, right? And at least I was studying till I was 28 <laughs> with a PhD and all that stuff, right? But yeah, keep learning and keep, cool. and after that, give back at some point. That's nice feedback. Yeah. I think we had another question. I saw someone with a mic. Yeah. You've got one here, yeah. Hi, um, sorry. My question is, uh, since we, you already have this whole wonderful technology, I also grew up in a rural area, and I know that for farmers, yeah, 30 minutes counts as real time, I guess. But my question is, is, are we able to take this to the next level to provide with people with predictions about seasonal changes, um, crop yields, um, cow health, I don't know, anything that can give them some sort of looking forward to the future, how much money they're going to make, costs, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I didn't get into the details of that, but that big blue box that I had, on the right-hand side, there were some ag services. This is where we realize our limitations. We are not the ag experts, but we work with universities and professors who understand agriculture, and we're working with uh, Iowa State, Cornell, uh, UC Davis and Washington State University to build those. So we built a precision irrigation solution, precision pH solution. In places like India, we are doing things like sowing prediction, giving feedback to farmers saying when to sow, uh, which pest is likely to happen. We have a pest prediction service. But these are things where we are relying more on partners, people, and that's why if there are agricultural startups here or companies that understand agriculture, we work with them to, this is more like a platform, on top of which we are solving some of yeah. the hard problems, but the domain expertise is where we rely to, on people who understand that to provide that service. But that's the ultimate goal. That's what we want to do in the developed world as well as in the developing world. Thank you. Okay, yeah. well, thanks. I'll take the mic.